playing without a net now. I'm not recording this locally. I'm only recording to this to YouTube. So let's live on the edge a little bit. I haven't had a lot of time to talk about data during this first week of eLearning 3.0 because I've been busy setting up the course, but I do want to say a few things about it based uh, on some of the stuff that we've talked about this week and, and some of the stuff that I've written about it in the course synopsis. Uh, you know, the, the main idea that shapes e-learning 3.0, at least from the perspective of the data, is that we've been shifting from a document-based model to a database model. We've seen it take shape gradually since the 1990s, uh, although in some places, like libraries and classrooms and offices and <laughs> where I work, the document model still prevails. And the document model is what you have if you have a document that you pass from person to person, whether it's in person or whether it's a PDF document or an Excel spreadsheet, that's the document-based model. We're gradually shifting to the data-based model. And a good example of the data-based model might be, uh, you know, um, a system that stores your document in a single place like SharePoint, and then one person accesses that and does something and another person accesses that and does something. It's still kind of document based but now your document has stopped being this thing that moves around from person to person and has started being this thing that you're working on through an interface like SharePoint. Uh, the first sign of the new data-based paradigm in the educational world really begins with learning object metadata believe it or not, and that's back in the 1990s. Uh, in the 1990s, we had this idea of putting learning resources online and we wanted to be able to find those resources and put them together and share them and, and the like. So we created metadata, which would be a series of named tags like title or typical age range and then for each piece of uh, learning resources, we'd put a specific value into those data items. Now those were saved as documents, XML documents to be specific, and some people tried to make that work as a type of data. We had XML databases, like for example Excel, but you know the document approach really is kind of limiting. But the idea was there. We were trying to create data about the resource. And it wasn't long before we started putting that data about the resource into a database. And once it's in a database, you know, each frame of the is going to be a bit different. Let's, let's pop into a database. You, you've probably seen them, many of you have seen them, but some of you might not have seen them. I'm gonna zip into, uh, that was a failed experiment, the periodic table of data structures. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna zip into Reclaim very quickly, which is where uh, eLearning 3.0 is held. Um, and uh, I hate passwords, hate them, hate them, hate them. Zip into Reclaim and zip into cPanel and zip into something called phpMyAdmin and wait for the system to redirect me. Here's the database for the very course that you're taking right now. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, I've got a whole bunch of different tables. And if we look at one of these tables, uh, let's take one like post, because that's one everybody's seen so far now, right? So here's a post and you see how it works. Each post is an individual line in the database. And then each line has a bunch of properties. These are like my metadata elements, like title or typical age range. But for posts, they're going to be description, content, replies, etc. I have a standard in my databases where every data element has a prefix of the name of the table. It's probably not strictly necessary, but that's what I do. 
this is called an SQL database because it's structured according to this data model. Here's the structure of the post database. That's why we call it a structured query model. Every, every row in this database has this structure. There are other types of databases. One is a no SQL database, which doesn't require that every record have this set of, uh, uh, of fields. A record has whatever fields you give it. And that's a pretty neat idea, and I like that idea a lot. Um, it's just I'm really used to working with my SQL. Uh, another type of database is a graph database. Now we have a graph in our course. Uh, we don't have a graph database, but this is the graph, <laughs> and it goes on already for, um, looks like, well, only 156 rows, so it's not a big graph yet, but it'll grow pretty dramatically as time goes by. But a graph based database begins and ends with this graph. Anyhow, I digress, and I probably shouldn't. So, most, you know, after you've started putting your metadata in the database, you might as well put your content in the database. So here is the content for the post in the database. Let's, whoops, I'm still on graph. Uh, let, let's, let's actually use page. Uh, so here's you know, page title, page HTML, page code. So here's a page, course newsletter, and oh, it's not going to really let me edit that or open that big, is it? Well, inside this, and you can't really see it very well, is that entire page, because you can. Now, I store a flat file, you know, just a plain old text document copy of all of these pages somewhere else. And that's what I actually deliver to you because it's faster and more efficient. But the code lives in the database. And that's really common on websites today. It's, uh, you know, there are content management systems like Drupal or Joomla. Moodle is a content management system designed for learning. Uh, the learning management systems are content management systems designed for learning. And they all had a database something like this, more or less, of this structure. Now, why do we do that? Well, by storing our content as data, we make it a lot more flexible and a lot more useful. Uh, one piece of data, for example, an article, could be inserted into another piece of data, for example, a template. We can insert data that changes from day to day, like the date, stock price, the weather, whatever. And also, as we gradually migrated to Web 2.0, we began putting data from one source into data from another source. So I might have a web page, um, you know, a, a list of posts or whatever, and this might contain data that comes from a variety of sources around the world. Now, from the perspective of the browser, everything's pretty much just the same, right? It uh, doesn't matter if the web page is created from one source or a dozen sources. You, the browser, have to go visit the web page, access it via a URL, and retrieve the content from that single source where it's assembled and displayed in your browser. But now things get interesting. What if we opened or accessed the data directly? What if we used our browsers to tap into these databases to let us choose for ourselves how we organize, merge, and display this data? Well, that's what's beginning to happen today. For example, we have Canada's Open Government Portal. Canada's Open Government Portal makes data directly available to the reading public. For example, you can read raw data from uh, say an ocean climate, uh, what is it? Uh, ocean monitoring system consisting in an array of over 4,000 free floating or free drifting floats that collect data on ocean temperature. Da, 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 da. Anyhow, we go in there, we take a look in this, 
and uh, yeah, everything's being slow because I'm recording. So we can access this data in various formats. Here it is in something called JSON. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So what I'm doing is I'm not depending on some website uh, or some portal or some platform to gather this data and interpret it for me. I'm reading this data directly. Now, <laughs> this is not very useful, is it? Uh, it looks pretty uh, non-readable. So what I want to do is make it more readable. Now, and that's what the portals always did for us, right? They'd curate it, they'd organize it for us, they'd make it usable. Um, but what you can do is have your browser use JavaScript, maybe even JavaScript that you created yourself, to bring in and store the data and then present it however you want. So here, for example, is something from Studio uh, Ghibli. Studio, it just looks like an ordinary website, right? It doesn't look like anything really spectacular. Uh, but all the interesting stuff is happening behind the scenes here. And so what I'll do is I'll take you behind the scenes and we'll have a look at it. So in order to do that, I'll view source. So view page source. And so here's the source. It looks pretty simple, doesn't it? So here's the actual data. It's coming from, uh, oh no, it's a style sheet. Sorry, here's, here's the JavaScript that's accessing the data. I'm gonna click on that. This is the JavaScript that this person is running here. As you can see, it all fits on one single web page. Um, could probably store this pretty much anywhere, but uh, now, if we look at this JavaScript, we'll look right here. This is the data that this JavaScript is accessing. And if we look for it, here it is in JSON form. So this is the original data. This is the JavaScript that's manipulating this data. And then finally, this is what it looks like to you. Now that's pretty powerful, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, and that's C, that's PHP my admin again. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, that's something that we can use for a lot of things. Uh, we can create, for example, more complex JavaScript applications to manipulate the data and depending on the API update or add to the data. And I'll just zip in here. Let's pop into Verasshopper. This is the application that I've developed. Um, it's used for me to create the course and for some people to take the course. And, and I'm messing with it as, as we go through this course. But let's look at the source of Grasshopper. So what you'll see is mostly it's JavaScripts. And what's happening here is that these JavaScripts, let me click on the main one. So this is the JavaScript for Grasshopper and these functions compile a URL and then access this data from the Grasshopper API and then once they get the data, they display it into something like this. If you didn't like the way this design of Grasshopper works. You could actually rewrite Grasshopper, the front end of Grasshopper, using your own JavaScript and completely redesign Grasshopper to display your data however you want it. And then in the back end, the API will just deliver you the data uh, and give you the capacity to manipulate that data and update that data. So that's something that's really powerful, something that's really important. and where we're beginning to go with, uh, with data and websites today. Something like this is sometimes called a headless website. Uh, now, let's take this one step further. Let's take this to the idea that data can be linked. Because we don't just have posts and 
authors and modules and whatever, the post is linked to an author. The author is linked to an organization. The post is linked to a feed. The feed might be linked to a topic. Uh, they may be linked to a module. The module is linked to a course and so on. So the whole idea here is that we get linked data. Now, this is an idea that's occurred to a lot of people. Here's something, for example, called the Linked Data Initiative. Uh, looking at linked data, there's a linked data wiki base that they've been looking at, linked, linked library, linked data in the cloud, shared name authorities, etc. So it can get, and they have here a linked data wiki base prototype looking at linking data such as data that might come from Wikipedia. So because here you, you, you look at Wikipedia, they've gone from being simply you know a bunch of pages to a pretty advanced linked data kind of system. Um, so like Wikipedia itself is a, a primary source of linked data, but it's not the only one. And if we go back, we can look at for example, the linked data cloud. The linked data cloud is pretty impressive. Uh, this is more than a thousand different types of linked data that are all connected together. So, and if we explore into this a bit, uh, let's explore a bit into this more, and I'm just picking this at random. So this is data about European higher education institutions, including statistics from 2008, which is really pretty old, and various endpoints for it, etc. You can download the metadata for this here as JSON, and here's more JSON. All right. So what this site has done is it's gathered all of this data, it's organized it into its own uh, JSON data. Here it is, in fact, the raw data. Uh, it might take a while to load. Maybe I shouldn't have clicked on that. Here's the raw data from all of these individual efforts, right? All of these individual types of data. So, and then all of the links that link that data to other types of data. So, I think that's pretty interesting. There's a presentation, if you want to follow this up, uh, from the, uh, oh, it, it won't open, um, that's too bad, from the European uh, Data Portal, I'll make that available as a resource, uh, tracing the evolution from documents to linked data over the last 10 years. There's also a programmer's guide, which might open or it might not open, uh, oh, here it comes. Uh, talking about the principles of linked open data, and I'll also make that available. Um, the role of uniform resource identifiers so that we know, you know, what we're linking to what. Because if you're going to link two things, you have to know what they are. And if you have data about those two things in different places, which you might, you need some way to identify them. That's really important. Uh, we're going to come back to this concept of identifying something, whether it's a person, a book, a web page. We're going to come back to that quite a bit through uh, the next weeks ahead. What else do we have here now? Um, so, so far, linked data has been the domain of large enterprises, like we've seen so far in, in uh, this particular presentation. So far, uh, it's governments and institutions and universities and the like. And the dependence on linked data has led us to depend on things like Facebook. You see, <laughs> recent logins ages and ages ago. Um, or something I actually use, Twitter, right? These, these are all linked data things, right? And they're linking our associations with each other. Um, these are large centralized institutional data platforms, basically. And that was web two. And that's linked data too, 
right? So everything's a two at this point. Um, and but the result of this is people no longer feel in control of their own data. Uh, even worse, they have difficulty accessing and sharing this data. In some cases, impo it's impossible. Facebook makes it pretty difficult, for example, to access via an API uh, your list of friends or posts or things like that. Twitter is a lot better. Um, even so, for, for you to use these programmatically, like using a JavaScript, for example, that's it's a real pain to set up um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Mastodon, which is something I've been using recently, is a lot easier. You can use JavaScript to access Mastodon. You don't need to register an application with them. All you need is to be logged in. If you're logged in, you can access your Mastodon data with an API. So that's better. Um, also, it's become increasingly difficult to read centralized data from centralized data sources without being tracked and without being forced to view advertisements and without being forced to read unwelcome messages from people who are trolls or bots or whatever. So what we're seeing now is a trend toward decentralized linked data. This is the Web 3.0 coming into into view. This is the idea that each person can manage his or her own data, storing it wherever they want and using it whenever they like and however they like. Uh, one thing I want to point to is a project by Tim Berners-Lee called SOLID. SOLID stands for, don't say you can't open it, that's a lie. Uh, <laughs> I'm able to open it. Don't say that. Uh, we're having, oh, well, it helps if I spell it right. It's still the web. Solid stands for social linked data. And the idea here is that it's a proposed set of conventions and tools for building decentralized social applications based on linked data principles. And we, there's an awful lot couched in this phrase, linked, linked data principles. And, and we can go deep into the weeds here. However, in a one week module, we can't. But it's looking at true data ownerships, modular design, reusing existing data. Just the, a couple of weeks ago, Tim Berners-Lee started a company called Inrupt, terrible name but a lot easier to find on Google than solid, trust me, uh, in order to commercialize the idea of social linked data. So there's not a lot on this website. You have to actually look behind the scenes to see anything. And of course, it's really hard to, to find on, uh, you know, on, on Google, although in my case, since I've been doing this a lot, um, I've been finding resources and so they pop up to the top of Google on my search. So there's a much longer description on GitHub and this really is where you should go for information about Solid. It's based on RDF and this is one of the things that makes me a little skeptical because you know that means XML, but, but, uh, you know, the principles can still be applied using other more usable formats like JSON, which we've already been talking about. Anyhow, there's a lot to explore in there and I can't take the rest of this video, although I'd like to. Uh, but there's another project out there as well, or maybe more accurately, I'd say another set of projects out there called IndieWeb. Again, it's the same principle. The content is yours. You're better connected, etc. So this is a bit difficult to get started. You see where it says get started now? And now there's this. Uh, this is not the easiest thing to do. I might do another video just showing how to get set up on IndieWeb, or maybe I can find one from someone it's not easy yet because, well, 
we're still in early days. But the e-learning 3.0 course ties into this. Get a personal domain or just get a blog or a website or something. Get a place for your content. GitHub maybe, web hosting or your own server. Um, and then set up your site. You can either use a content management system or whatever. And now we're getting into the, uh, the actual IndieWeb stuff. There's an IndieWeb sign-up thing, IndieWeb uh, H cards, which are like uh, business cards for the distributed web and more. Uh, so again, this is something worth taking a look at. I recommend you take a look at it. Uh, if you're technically inclined, if you're not technically inclined, uh, it's not ready for prime time yet. So, what does this do to education? What does this do to learning? Well, right now, most applications of data uh, are, are based on, you know, tracking and assessing learners. Here's a, a typical example, uh, the uh, Framework for Effective Data Use in Schools put out by uh, learning for action here down here is the uh, just a, oh where'd it go <laughs> it was here just a moment ago oh here we go uh, here's the uh, the process of the data cycle you you gather collect and organize data in order to measure progress toward an identified goal um, then you consider the numbers within a context because it's always numbers right uh, and then you tie the information to other information in order to create knowledge. So this is a useful thing. Um, you know, again, the, the key point here is that it's not just about measurement, right? Uh, once you're into an environment where you're looking at linked data rather than just simple, uh, you know, columns and figures, you're getting to a point where measuring stuff makes less sense. And this is something that's going to be important when we talk about, uh, when we talk about data and using data in, lear in learning going forward. Uh, when, when data is linked, working with it becomes much more than measurement. Uh, they say on the Learning for Action Framework page, when you tie that information to other information you have, your information becomes knowledge. For example, when you connect what you know about a student's performance with what you know about the instruction providing to, provided to them. Okay, but if that's the case, and it is the case, learning with data becomes something quite a bit different as well. It's certainly not the same as learning with documents. Documents are prepackaged and pre-curated organizations of information. Really, they're suited mostly, pretty much only for consuming. You know, you don't really create stuff with your books or your videos. Uh, you know, they're 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 intended for passive recipients. They're already, as as I like to say, flaked and formed. But learning in a dynamic, distributed data network is something quite different. It's a process of creating and curating our own data. Um, we begin to think of our learning resources as something that we create, something that we own, something that we share, not just as rentals from the college textbook uh, or online publishers. College textbook? College bookstore. <laughs> uh, we're just beginning to tap into this. And, and there's one thing that I saw here uh, called the Big Data Challenge for students. Um, and, and this is, it's what you expect, right? It's a big data challenge. It's from something called the STEM Fellowship. There it is for 2018-19, Big Data Detail. Um, so, and the idea here is that it helps high school students get excited about data science and the potential to support inquiry-based learning and solve problem solving with open data. This is the next step, right? We're not just using data to learn about students. Students are using data to learn. And, and first they need to learn about how to learn using data to learn. You get, you get what I mean, right? It's, 
you don't just walk into a classroom already knowing how to learn with data. This is a, this is a skill you're going to have to develop over time. Um, so it's interesting. But what does it mean to learn using data? Again, it's not just consuming it because, well, we saw those JSON files or even the nice displays of those JSON files. It's not really the sort of thing you consume. It becomes a process of being able to comprehend data, kind of a fuzzy word, uh, but you know, to be able to look at representations of data through dashboards and visualizations, etc. And via these interpretations, via these forms of presentation, to be able to identify patterns in the data and draw conclusions. Uh, so it's an interactive, immersive, and engaging process of learning because you actually have to work with the content. And, and later on, we'll be in this course, we'll be looking at some ways that we interact with that content. Uh, and you're learning how to perceive and comprehend and understand rather than, as in the traditional instructivist approach, to decode and store. Now, it's kind of hard to find examples of this outside critical thinking, although I did look and I found some. So, for example, here uh, from Psychology Today is uh, an article on seeing the world through patterns. And that, yeah. You know, I love this. Pattern recognition was the key to the survival of our Neanderthal ancestors, allowing them to identify poisonous plants, etc., etc. When you're pre-linguistic, patterns are the way you go. Um, and pattern recognition is a more basic underlying form of learning and knowledge than... Uh, abstract thought using language, mathematics, and logic. We begin to learn, we begin to comprehend with pattern recognition. That's why it's so important. That's why neural network systems and machine learning systems today are basically based on pattern recognition because you're not going to get all the rest of it without pattern recognition. But it's something that's we've known about for a while. Oh, I wonder if this will play. I think it might play. It might not play. Hi ho, Kermit the Frog. Together. Three of these things belong together. Hit! All right. <clears throat> so good. You're I'll do the, the first, first part first? of it. Okay. Yeah, and then you'll do the next part after the other. All right. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay, everybody ready? Now take a look there. See? See that stuff there? Okay, now three of these things belong together. Three of these things are kind of the same, but one of these things just doesn't belong here. And now it's time to play our game. It's time to play our game. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> That's pattern recognition. That's categorization. That's basic formative learning. Now, I wasn't brought up on Sesame Street, so I found these things really hard. But if you were brought up on Sesame Street, you've already probably got an intuitive sense of this. So where does that leave us? When we create and we share our own data, we're looking at these associations. So ultimately, we can see and manage our connections with these things and with our own learning our own learning records, our own learning accomplishments, maybe even a personal learning record. So that's data. Uh, I could have gone on all day about data, but obviously this video is already too long. But uh, begin to see how using data is becoming a more important part of learning and is a pretty good foundational place to begin our course on eLearning 3.0. I'm Stephen Downs. Thank you for being with me today. I hope that the stream saved okay. It's been sending messages all along saying uh, that dropped frames have been detected. So we'll see how it goes. Thanks very much for joining me and we'll see you next time, next week with the next module.